Michelle Williams, a child of destiny, is a singer, actress, author, producer, philanthropist, and has a host of other titles to her name. But above all, she's a woman of God who seeks to be a light in a world of chaos, destruction, and darkness. This is Justified by Jury, and in Chapter 3 of the Triumphant Arise series, we will discuss her upbringing, her rise to fame, her struggle with mental health as she maintains the pressures of being in the public eye and under constant criticism, and her overall will to be triumphant above it all as she keeps God first and aspires to inspire others to find that same light. Let's get into her story. Born Tanitra Michelle Williams on July 23, 1979 in Rockford, Illinois, she was one of four children to her parents Dennis and Anita. She grew up in a firmly religious household, and like many other singers of her time, she would start her singing in the children's choir, delivering her first solo rendition of Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, at the tender age of seven. However, she did not like being in the children's choir. She said, you know when you look at the choir and the kids look like they don't want to be there? Yeah, that was me. In school, she was often mistreated for being one of the nerdy kids, being skinny, and not getting any attention from boys. But when it was time to sing, oh, that's when her light shined through. She was a lead singer for the West Middle School Inspirational Choir and sang often at her home congregation, the St. Paul Church of God in Christ. But by seventh grade, Tanitra had endured and was witness to traumas that you and I could never know. And these experiences negatively affected her mental health. She had long periods of time where she wanted to stay in bed, her grades were dropping, she became distant, and there were even times where she didn't want to be alive, but would always eventually shake these feelings and put her energy into the church, directing the choir, becoming the praise and worship leader, and being an usher. She would also join two church-based singing groups, one being Chosen Expression and the other being United Harmony with her sister. I am he. She would use her singing talents to praise the Lord, but she maintained realistic expectations and didn't take being in either group seriously for a career, as her family pushed education first. And she would tell herself, well, who's going to come to Rockford to see the talent that we have here? She would graduate from Rockford Auburn High and pursued a degree in criminal justice at Illinois State University. She also became the director for the Martin Luther King Youth Unity Choir part-time. Now this is how God works, y'all. During her sophomore year, her friend Freddie, who she hadn't talked to in years, had been moving and came across a piece of paper with Tanitra's phone number on it. He called to see if the number was still good, and she answered. During their chat, he said, you know I'm playing for Monica now, and we finna go on tour with 98 Degrees. It's finna be fresh to death. What you got going on? And Nitra said nothing, but if Monica needs a background vocal, give me a call. Now she was just playing around, not thinking anything else of it. But he called back a week later and said, hey, can you get to Atlanta tomorrow? Mo is having auditions for background singers. You trying to sing, right? And she said, I can't afford a next day plane ticket. But Freddie's cousin worked for United Airlines and was able to get her a buddy pass. So she flew to Atlanta, auditioned to sing background for the superstar, and Monica put her on after hearing her vocal talent which was described as a combination of Erica Badu meets Macy Gray. Very distinct, raspy, and soulful. She would tour with Mo for six months, and in early 1999, Destiny's Child would open up for them at one of the spots, and Tanitra would get a chance to meet the group at the hotel before the performance. But by the end of 99, tensions between group members and management resulted in their group's manager, Matthew Knowles, firing two of their members, and the group's choreographer, Janella, who also happened to be a dancer for Monica, heard that they were looking for new members and remembered Tanitra's supreme work ethic and singing abilities. She would put in a good word to Tina Knowles, who was the group's stylist and lead singer Beyonce's mother. Tina would call Tanitra and say, hey, we've heard great things about you. We want you to come to Houston to audition. So she got flewed out to Houston 
and Tina and her daughter Solange picked Tanitra up from the airport and took her to meet Beyonce and Kelly to audition for the group and hang out to get a feel for each other. When me and Beyonce met Michelle, she was like, I like her. I said, I like her too, Beyonce. She said, she gives off a light. I don't know what it is. I was like, I know, huh? Next thing we know, she was in Houston. We were rehearsing. It was beautiful. She was like, I love y'all's music. I did walk away saying, this year I'm going to be singing with this group. Never in a million years did I think that. The girls gave Michelle a chance to audition and the opportunity of a lifetime. They all went out to Papado and ate good and sent her back home. And she told herself she hoped to see them again someday. But that hope would come quicker than she thought. In January of 2000, she got the call to join Destiny's Child temporarily to help them finish out their writings on the wall obligations and promos. But it was the same day that she was supposed to be shadowing an autopsy at the coroner's office for her degree in forensics. Believe it or not, it was a tough decision to make as it was embedded in her mind that education was top priority and it took a lot to secure this shadowing. But in the end, she would reschedule the appointment for never and would be brought in to replace former group member Latoya alongside Destiny who was replacing Latavia. And in order to usher them in, they had to make several changes, one being the name change. Why, why didn't she you never use Sinitra? Two ghetto, two She would go by her middle name, Michelle, and Destiny would go by her government name, Farah. Also, every member of Destiny's Child just so happened to be born in 1981, except Michelle, who was two years older and turning 21 soon. But the Destiny's Child brand, being image-based, would have Michelle lie and say that she was 19 instead, which actually happened a lot with many celebrities prior to the rise of the internet. We've got two new members to the group. Elise, can you just introduce yourself to me so that the rest of the world can know who you are also? Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Williams. I'm 19 years old from Illinois. What's up, everybody? I'm Farrah. I'm from L.A., and I'm also 19. Okay. But ultimately, her biggest adjustment aside from the newfound fame itself was her image. She was fine. And she was like, oh, God, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, my mom saw the video. She was not ready to see her little girl with her cleavage out like that. But now, she's, she's fine. I was scared to try new things with my hair. I didn't wear makeup. The new girls had big shoes to fill, and the pressure was on for them to pick up the torch and carry on where the other members had been doing it for a decade. And for Michelle, this new added pressure hadn't helped her undiagnosed depression situation. But with this huge blessing and everyone rooting for her back home, she didn't have time to worry with it. The money was coming in and you're living your dreams. Those demons should go away soon, right? But things were strict and Michelle spent most of her time with Farrah as they shared hotel rooms and would bond together as the new girls on the block. However, Michelle was very much a by-the-book team player and workaholic, whereas Farrah marched to the beat of her own drum and would often sneak out to clubs at night which left Michelle in a compromising position, as she wasn't going to do anything to put her employment in jeopardy. But does she keep it a secret and say, go on here girl, just be back before sunrise? Okay, but what if management found out? Or what if something bad happened to Farrah and Michelle didn't say anything? How would that have looked? Eventually, her integrity and conviction got the best of her and she would explain to management Farrah's dealings, which did not help Farrah's ongoing gripes with management at the time. Things eventually came to a head in July of 2000, when Farrah got into a heated verbal altercation with the management team and abruptly quit the group. Now, according to Farrah, Michelle did try to call and convince her to make amends with the team, but Farrah was done, and now all eyes were on Michelle, who was now filling the void of two members. The group would continue to get more popular and made Michelle a permanent member, and by July of 2001, the group had sold an additional 5 million copies of their Writings on the Wall album and would skyrocket to number one with their Survivor album, which went on to sell over 10 million copies. The group was at an all-time high, but the depression still crept in for Michelle. She tried her best to mask her feelings to B and Kelly, but would confide in Matthew what she was feeling. I did speak with our, our manager and I said, hey, I think I'm depressed. And he said, no, y'all just, y'all got Barbie dolls, Mattel and Hasbro. Y'all just signed a multi-million dollar deal. Y'all are finna go on tour. There's no way you can be depressed. Wow. So, so at that time, I said, well, maybe you're right. I thought maybe I'm homesick, hormonal. She went on to say, I thought I had escaped it, 
I thought I had escaped what made me depressed. No, depression came right along with me to the Grammys, right along with me to meet some of my idols like Sting and Whitney Houston. Sheesh. So I went along with the notion that maybe you're not depressed, maybe you're just tired. Award-winning photographer Jillian Laub did an article for Vanity Fair saying that around this time, she was commissioned by the New York Times Magazine to photograph Destiny's Child for a special women's issue. She spent the day backstage with them as they prepared for that evening's concert in Albany, New York. She said that immediately following the performance, Michelle had exited the stage crying. She said, I'm not sure why, but I think she wasn't happy with her performance. The other girls didn't leave her side. They huddled around her and comforted her. It was quite touching to witness. Not knowing whether she had depression or not, she would cope by simply isolating herself on tour. On her days off, she would close herself in her hotel room, turn off the lights, close the curtains, and wouldn't get out of bed which she never realized were all signs of depression. But again, with all the success they had and the sudden horrific death of Alia, she felt it best to be grateful for the life she was living because it could all be taken away in an instant. Our age is just scary because that could have been any one of us. And she was an angel and I know that now she's, she's with God. They will perform a tribute for Alia at the Lady of Soul Awards and by December, they had released a Christmas album and Michelle was on top of the world. And I would like to just really, 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 you know, give my thanks, my love, and all of everything of me to Beyonce and Kelly. They're wonderful. When things, you know, they, they look crazy and we're all human and sometimes I know we all get down with whatever, but I want to tell y'all that I love y'all. Let's keep going on. And I love y'all. And by spring of 2002, Destiny's Child had announced that each one of their members would release solo albums over the next year through the manager Matthew Knowles' label, Music World Entertainment. And the first one up was Tanitra herself. And on April 16th, 2002, she released her first album, Heart to Yours, making her the first Destiny's Child member, past or present, to release an album. For the project, she returned to her gospel roots and would feature artists like Mary Mary, Shirley Caesar, Isaac Carey, Carl Thomas, and of course, Destiny's Child. But her going gospel was not without its criticism, specifically to gospel fans who felt like she was riding the fence. Everyone talks about went from bootylicious to doing your gospel album, but no one ever talks about the gospel medley that's on our album. Thank you, Lord, hallelujah. I know Destiny Child, we've always done gospel songs, and we've always acknowledged God and everything that we did, so it, it was a kind of easy transition for me. Still, the album peaked at number one on the U.S. Billboard Gospel Albums chart and would become 2002's biggest selling gospel album with over 500,000 copies sold worldwide. The lead single, Heard a Word, which became very popular amongst Destiny's Child fans and appeared on the remix album, This Is The Remix, spoke on the importance of turning to God amidst the pain and strife of life, with lyrics like, I heard a word saying, girl, you'll be fine, a word that would ease my troubled mind. The song Better Place would be dedicated to the recent victims of the 9-11 attacks. The album would feature production by Warren Baby Dub Campbell, Mario Winans, P. Diddy, and even Michelle's brother Aaron, who had previously produced Michelle's solo, Oh Holy Night, that was featured on the Christmas album. For this album, he had produced my favorite track, number one, Heart to Yours. Billboard ranked Michelle as the fifth top gospel artist of 2002. The album was also a success on the US Billboard Top R&B Hip Hop Albums chart, where it peaked at number 17, and it won Michelle an award for Best Gospel Act at the 2002 MOBO Awards, and Heard a Word would be featured on the Platinum Certified WOW Gospel 2003 Hits album. Over the course of the next two years, Michelle would bounce between her solo work and secular R&B music with her group. Destiny's Child would embark on a world tour where Michelle had performed a few of her gospel songs, Solo, along with the group's gospel medley, before she would release her second album, Do You Know, followed by another Destiny's Child album. Throughout this time period, Michelle and her other group members received backlash for essentially double dipping, as many religious folks in music felt like you couldn't sing about loving Jesus one minute 
and saying you want to cater to your thugging street soldier who make you lose your breath the next minute. Michelle, however, would address the judgment, saying, I can't worry about these church folks because we got some of us in here that are judging people but can't keep their marriages together. Get yourself together first. Once I see that you'll bust heaven wide open, then I'm with you. But until then, I can't let people judge me or even bring that to me. Gospel isn't the only singing option for Christians. You got to go outside the church to reach people. You're not any better than anyone else. She would go on to say that they don't know her personally, nor her character, saying that what's done in Destiny's Child doesn't represent everything about me or who I am. She maintained that the group were not sex symbols and did not want to be looked at as such and said, I'm just trying to reach people, inspire, encourage, and help lead people to Christ and getting folks to know him in this last day. Her second album would feature much heavier and grander use of live instrumentation and had a host of songwriters like Dawkins and Dawkins, Beyonce, who co-wrote the song I Know, which was featured in the film Fighting Temptations, and even Solange herself would try her hand at the pen, co-writing the movement. And even Michelle herself would write six out of the 14 songs on the project. Unfortunately, the album tanked, debuting at a disappointing 120 on the Billboard 200. And the song Do You Know, released as the lead single, wasn't the best choice for its position. Its accompanying music video, though inspirational, only showcased the imbalance between her secular and Christian images. It didn't connect with audiences the way that the label had hoped. So they would reissue the album and add a few bonus tracks, which brought sales up to 78,000 copies in the States. They released My Only Love Is You as the next single, which was produced by Michelle's brother and fit her vocals perfectly. As in typical fashion, brother knows best. She did several live performances to promote the song as she did with her previous single. And though the song saw a few remixes, there would be no music video. And ultimately the entire era of Do You Know underperformed though the album did earn a nomination at the 2004 Mobile Awards. I will say that one of the album's highlights is the last track, Have You Ever, in which she sings, So you search for security, love of money and what it brings, thought you'd buy you some happiness, but you found out it didn't last. One thing I want to say is that it's all his anyway, and in many ways she was speaking to herself. In the midst of everything, she found her way to theater, taking the lead role in Aida, a musical about an Ethiopian princess who was kidnapped and enslaved by the Egyptian army, who ends up falling in love with a general in that army. Her performances wowed the audience at every show, which was from November of 2003 to February of 2004. And in November of that year, Destiny's Child would release their last full-length album called Destiny Fulfilled, which was a massive success, with numerous singles, awards, and accolades. The album featured all three girls as songwriters and had producers like Rock Wilder, Ninth Wonder, Rodney Jerkins, and Beyonce herself. Michelle's brother would also lend a hand on the song Love. During this time, the pressure was heavy from the public as Beyonce had already emerged as a solo artist and there would be constant comparisons between the girls. But they all loved one another and managed to rise above the nonsense and did it very well with class. Right up until November 15th, is Destiny's Child Soldier! Yeah. To many viewers around the world, it was hilarious, and many others felt bad for her. But for Michelle, it was traumatic. At this point, I laugh about it. I don't watch it. I do not watch it because I don't need to watch um, drama. But I can, I can laugh about it. <laughs> Okay, seriously, I can laugh about it. My life is just what it means to literally be resilient. My life is literally what it means to fall and get back up. And however that encourages you in whatever field you're in, whatever mistake you made, whatever error you made, however you fell, did you get back up? Did you, did you get back up and find the beat, honey? Honey, I got up in formation, honey. I was long in formation, honey. We was long in formation. Probably took me a good 12 or 13 years to watch it. Really? Mm-hmm. It was bad. I don't know what happened that day. I just was <laughs> minding my business. Honey, I was, honey, tipping for my life. <laughs>
baby and the floor met me. Honey, the floor came and met me. The, in it, the floor came up. Uh-uh. Though the media would make Michelle the punching bag and would continue to do so for years to come, the fans would still lift her up as Destiny's Child would wrap up their Destiny Fulfilled era in late 2005, with Michelle being solidified as the group's queen of bridges. Move your body up and down, make your booty touch the ground. We know each other too well. Whoa. The rain it fell on me, wanting it more and more cause of your love's in the air I'm breathing. By now, Destiny's Child had announced their official disbandment, and Michelle was kind of unsure of just how she was going to proceed. I was like, uh-oh, are you going to have to go to AutoZone to sell windshield wiper fluid now? <laughs> In spite of her worries with her next move, she would get fast to work, and after having recorded a remake of Let's Stay Together for the Roll Bound soundtrack, she became part owner of the WNBA team, The Chicago Sky and would make appearances on the TV show Celebrity Duets, showcasing more of her singing, and Half and Half, showcasing her acting. And she would combine the two to once again return to the Broadway stage, this time as Suge Avery in Oprah Winfrey's Chicago-based production of the musical The Color Purple, which she described as a dream come true and earned her an award for lead female actress at the 18th annual NAACP Theater Awards. After picking up many different influences, she felt compelled to return to the studio to work on her third album, which she planned to deviate from her gospel sound and go into straight R&B. And it was sounding good. She played her initial set of songs for her mother, and her mom was like, that's nice, but you ain't got nothing to dance to? We need some up-tempo grooves too now, as the overall shift in music was becoming more dance pop oriented around this time. So Michelle would start to incorporate more dance pop and electronic synthy club bangers to her track list and unveiled Unexpected, in which she donned a new look and sound, which was vastly different from the church girl images or the seductive Destiny's Child images she bore in the past. Set for release on August 12th, it would be propelled by the single we Break the Dawn, which was written and demoed by Solange and produced by Wayne Wilkins and Andrew Frampton. The song would be registered under Britney Spears, leading some to think that it was initially intended for her upcoming album, but this wasn't the case. The song would be officially premiered in March of 2008 on People.com's website. The single received critical acclaim for its terrific fusion of European disco and dance pop, as well as its irresistible chorus. Solange's background vocals can still be heard on the chorus. The song dominated the US Billboard dance charts, topping the Hot Dance Airplay chart and peaking at number 4 on the Hot Dance Club Play chart. It also peaked at number 26 on the Billboard Global Dance Tracks chart. And like with any dance hit, the song would have a multitude of endless remixes, the most popular being the one with Flo Rida, which would also appear on the album. Now Michelle would perform the original song live on the Wendy Williams show and the early show, and also made appearances on Good Day LA and TRL to promote the track. However, it failed to chart on the US Billboard 200. But in Europe, despite minimal promotion, the single became her first song to chart on the UK singles chart, peaking at number 47. The single also charted in Hungary, where it peaked at number 38 on the Hungarian Radio Top 40. We Break the Dawn was featured on the season premiere of The City, as well as the season finale of America's Best Dance Crew, and in the film Noah's Ark jumping the broom. Michelle appeared as a guest judge on the episode Girl Groups of RuPaul's Drag Race, which featured a lip sync to the song. Despite these various appearances to promote the single, it still went by largely unnoticed, which was a shame because the song is phenomenal and among the best of its time. which is on iTunes today and in stores in October. I'm buying that song for my iPhone. Please right do. Right after the show Please ends. do. Thank you so that much. That is great. Sounds Jules, so that awesome. unbelievable? I remember her appearing on TRL to promote the track and only two men in the audience knew the song. And Michelle was so overjoyed and ecstatic, running around screaming, they know my song, they know my song. 
over the two boys singing their hearts out while everyone else just stared awkwardly. But hey, at least Michelle was happy. The song would be nominated for Best Vocal R&B Performance by a Female Artist at the 2008 New Now Next Awards, if that means anything to anyone. With things not looking too hot, her album would be delayed until October, and the label would push out another single called The Greatest, which was a pop ballad. Much like the previous single, this song would have an array of remixes, receive rave reviews from critics, and much airplay in clubs peaking at number one on the Dance Club Play chart and number 25 on the Billboard Global Dance Tracks chart, but saw little to no success elsewhere. The video premiered on Yahoo and peaked at number 76 on the US Hot 100 Music Video chart and number 32 on Yahoo's Top 100 R&B Music Video chart. Michelle was described by critics as appearing sweet, innocent, and warm and cuddly in the visual. In preparation for the album's release, Michelle would get up close and candid about her thoughts and feelings and didn't sugarcoat anything. She revealed feelings of being lonely and uncertain, but still hopeful for the best. Very stressful. These are just things that you guys get to look forward to as you get older, as you um, get a career of your own and you gotta make certain decisions. A lot of you all are graduating high school, going to college, so you'll know how it is to be on your own in a minute. And it's not easy. Some days I say, I'm going back home to live with my mama. <laughs> and there is a quote that stuck out to me, and it said, when you complain about what you don't have, then you won't have. Unfortunately for Michelle, her gospel fan base was not amused by the new music with no apparent spiritual or religious inspiration behind it. They felt like she had basically sold her soul. They felt alienated, so they would alienate her and withdrew support. And sadly, so would the label. By her album being pushed back to October 7th, just one month prior to Beyonce's I Am Sasha Fierce album, much of the focus from Matthew and Music World was going into the promotion over there where they knew they'd get a full return on their investment. So Michelle's album would debut with first week sales of 14,000 copies. Damn. They managed to squeeze out another single, Hello Heartbreak, in December of that year. But after seeing it had similar to less success than the previous singles, they didn't bother forking out funds for a music video, which was already underrated as hell because Michelle's voice paired with the music could have done well on the radio with the right push. But the label simply didn't care. The songs Till the End of the World, Lucky Girl, and Sick of It are some of my personal favorites from this era. Overall, her lyrics in Hello Heartbreak encompass the feelings that she had during this time. with Jesse Metcalf for really? the entire show, yes. Yeah, really? Um, you sing? <laughs> <laughs> Frustrated with how she kept being placed on back burner, she would part ways with Matthew, Music World, and Columbia all together and clung to God as he had much better plans for her. She would return to theater and became the first black woman to play the role of Roxy Hart in the hit musical Chicago on London's West End. Her limited engagement proved so successful that it was extended an additional three weeks by popular demand in 2009, and in early 2010, she would replace Ashley Simpson for the American leg of the musical, which consisted of a seven-week engagement at the Ambassador Theater in New York. Her performances were so stellar that they extended an additional 18 performances prior to joining the Los Angeles engagement of the national tour, which ran through May 9th. Well, go on here then, Michelle. And just so you know, Chicago is the longest running American musical in Broadway history, and its founding producer, Barry Weisler, said so himself that Michelle has proven to be a tremendous asset to Chicago, first in London last year and now on Broadway. In addition to being a fantastic performer, she's as delightful and genuine offstage as she is on stage. We are thrilled that she is not only able to extend her Broadway run, but to join our national tour for its third return engagement in Los Angeles. After her time on Broadway, she would return to Europe and make appearances on season eight of the British dance competition show, Strictly Come Dancing, which was the originator of the Dancing with the Stars franchise. She would drop the song Love Gun, which was a nice pop joint, 
She made appearances as a guest vocalist on a few different music videos in the dance scene around this time, like On The Run and Waiting On You, which rose to number 11 on the dance chart. She would also embark on a 28 city tour for the stage play, What My Husband Doesn't Know, featuring Brian J. White and Tiffany Haddish. In 2012, she would establish a friendship with Latoya Luckett, the superstar she originally replaced in Destiny's Child. They would go on to make several appearances together and formed a bond from their many similarities, which were initially some of what drew Kelly and Beyonce to Michelle in the first place. A lot of times we find ourselves being <laughs> catty, grass in a barrel, bucket, however you want to call it, pulling each other down instead of lifting each other up. This should send a message to you. Learn to love on each other. Love to praise and lift each other up. I have grown to love this woman. I love her spirit. I love her energy. I love her smile. I love everything that, that she is. I love how she stood tall. She kept her head up. And that's what she's supposed to do as a woman. Although her constant fears and worries had amplified to the point where she was going to therapy, and that's where she would be officially diagnosed with depression. Finally, she was able to identify what this sinking feeling was that she had all of these years and could put her mind at ease that she wasn't going crazy. She would reveal her diagnosis to the public and would constantly follow up with appointments and treatments before getting back out into the limelight. And she would need it, as by January of 2013, she had embarked on another musical tour, this time as Sandra in the Tony nominated musical Fella. But she would stop by the Super Bowl stage to join Beyonce and Kelly for a Destiny's Child reunion. And this event would be the biggest stage that the group would ever appear on. They performed a slew of hits and the fans and the media would go into a frenzy and her depression would flare up once more as though there was so much love and nostalgia, not to mention a 500% spike on the group's sales following the performance, drama would ensue from haters online who would criticize Beyonce as the headliner but also Michelle as they felt she lacked breath control and appeared stiff during the performance. And the ringleader by the name of Keisha Cole added a few hundred acres to the wildfire by tweeting about the performance saying, I think I was frightened to blink for a second. Then Michelle sung and woke my behind up from my days. She's always effing up the groove. She praised B and Kelly, but noted that Michelle is whack and always will be. Now, Tanitra ain't one to go back and forth with other celebrities over social media. So both her and Keisha would have a private conversation and settle their beef briefly, but Keisha felt that Michelle had taken a shot at her Soul Train performance a year prior and wasn't over it. Yeah, and it really hurt my feelings too that wow. she would, cause she's Christian mm -hmm. and she's a church girl and all of this, <laughs> but yet you call, you you know, we talk on the phone, you say you apologize for taking a tweet down that you said about me in the first place. Mm -hmm. Just felt like everybody just jumped on me cause I'm from Oakland, I'm the ghetto chick and I'm always starting everything when in actuality, I just say how I feel. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that would, I don't feel like I was starting nothing with her. I was just getting her back for what she said to me. Church girl versus ghetto chick, you wanna pray about it? And there was a lot going on in my timeline that someone used auto-tune on their mic. I didn't know who, so I was like, really? You can use auto-tune on your mic? And I, that was literally what it was. And you tweeted it while she somebody, was performing. No, 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 no. Oh. I hadn't seen it. Right. Still haven't seen it. So somebody hit me back. Loads of people replied, oh, my God, you going in on Keisha Cole? <laughs> so I deleted the tweet because I didn't know who, right. who it was at the time. Mm -hmm. So no, I did not personally attack so i deleted that because i don't do that on social media that's right. not what You're i'm Christian. about and mm -hmm. i don't have to at you on social media right. we had the same management oh, okay. for a time period so i can get your number i can call you i can run into you at an award show or somewhere and we can do it there i'm not gonna do it on social media after this it seems like the world had a renewed interest in michelle's shortcomings people were steadily reposting the clip of her falling and a blog titled Poor Michelle started trending on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and Instagram showcasing all of the times that Michelle got the quote unquote short end of the Destiny's Child stick. And at many points in her career, they targeted her weight, saying she was too frail and insinuating that she was on substances. Trust me, I wanna gain some weight, you know? So if one more website, tells me I need to eat a bowl of grits, pie pies, and a biscuit. I'm gonna beat you over the head with a biscuit. All right, all is well with me. I'm not sick, I'm not on drugs or anything stupid. Here 
clearly loves Beyonce. I she identifies more with Michelle. Because you know what it's like to fall and get stepped on over by your friends. Everybody's got a little Michelle in them. Not me, I'm Beyonce to my core. But after figuring, hey, if you can't beat them, join them, Michelle decided to cash in on the silliness. Hell, might as well. He's right, you know. Actually, I'm okay for right now. Draymond, would you care for something? I don't work here. I'm Michelle Williams of Destiny's Child. Oh, hey, you think you can introduce me to- And with a sudden burst of attention, she decided to strike musically while the iron was hot. She had already signed a record deal with Light Records, a gospel record label, and E1 Music as she was returning to gospel, but said that the new album would be an inspirational gospel project, which sounds like an R&B pop album, and she would premiere the lead single, If We Had Your Eyes, which was produced by Harmony Samuels and Warren Baby Dub Campbell. The song would be a moderate success, peaking at number 19 on the U.S. adult R&B songs, number 22 on the U.S. hot gospel songs, and number 2 on the U.S. hot R&B hip-hop single sales, and number 5 on the U.S. hot single sales. The song deals with seeing things through a spiritual lens, and its music video would feature both Harmony Samuels and LaToya. Critics and fans praised her singing style, and many went as far as to compare her to Fantasia. So Michelle did them one better and recruited Fantasia for the remix, which would appear on the upcoming new album. Ahead of the album's release, Michelle would release the song Fire, which would make references to many different scriptures and mention people in the Bible, such as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but putting a fresh, current, contemporary spin on things. The music video being equally as eloquent. But it would be the third single, Say Yes, that would catapult this entire era to the forefront. Now, all three members of Destiny's Child were featured on Beyonce and Kelly's 2013 projects. So when it was Michelle's turn, she sent advanced copies of her album to the other members, hoping to get them on the song Believe In Me. But they love Say Yes so much that they just had to jump on it instead. The Nigerian hymn was reworked into a modern sound and was notable for the group singing about Jesus in particular and were unapologetic in doing so as many songs that mention Jesus in a positive light were rarely mainstream by 2014. But even people who were not followers of Christ took a special appreciation with the song. You can't help but sing and jam along to it. It's infectious. It peaked at number one on the US Hot Gospel Songs chart for seven weeks and was ranked as one of the top 50 gospel songs of the decade. Internationally, Say Yes charted in Belgium, France, Netherlands, and the UK. It was awarded Song of the Year at the 2014 Gospel Touch Music Awards. Now Michelle would go on to release her fourth album, Journey to Freedom Without Matthew, on September 9th, 2014, and it became the most successful album of her solo career and is regarded by many critics as her best solo work to date. It was ranked as the number one best gospel album of 2014 by the Jubilee cast and number two on the U.S. top gospel albums. I got to throw these charts out here. Y'all got to y'all got to know about these chart positions, man. She would perform Say Yes with Beyonce and Kelly at the 30th annual Stellar Awards, where they had won Music Video of the Year. And they received a standing ovation for their performance, which has over 25 million views on YouTube. But a little known fact is that there was a bit of a hiccup in the beginning as they began singing while the announcer was still announcing. They would carry on with the performance and you would hear the crowd roar when they see just who all's up there. They would finish their performance, but to get things just right, the producers had the girls go back out and perform the song again. Now, the Stellar Awards is pre-taped, so when it aired weeks later, what viewers at home saw and what you see on a YouTube video is their second performance, and the crowd basically reacting to something they already saw. But still, both performances were lovely, and the girls killed it, looking flawless as usual. Michelle would go on to release Believe In Me as the last single, and it was an ode to believing in herself because people will tell you you're wonderful all day long, but if you don't believe it within, then you won't receive it. The message was definitely needed, and though I wish she would have put out just one more single, like the song Beautiful, which I think is one of her best songs to date, 
all was well that ended well for Michelle Mabel. She would star as a mentor in a reality TV competition show, Fix My Choir. She launched her Believe at Home betting collection on the Evon Network and had sang for the Obamas at the White House on two separate occasions. As you can see, Michelle was well accomplished outside of Destiny's Child, but even with all of the success she had, her heart was still very lonely. By March of 2017, she had just come out of an unhealthy situationship and her depression had spiked again. She said, I was in a horrible dark place. I just needed to go somewhere where I could get a message of hope and restoration, rejuvenation, and just get connected to God. Her friend recommended she go on a spiritual retreat called Elevate in Arizona, ran by Pastor Chad Johnson, who was a life coach and had also worked as a chaplain for pro sports teams, including the Pittsburgh Steelers and LA Dodgers. She went and enjoyed herself. In addition to being on a spiritual high, both her and Chad had an instant connection, and the attraction was there, but they stayed focused on the mission. After the retreat, Chad would text her saying, hey, how about we connect sometime? And she replied, connect? With six question marks. <laughs> and Chad, thinking that he just got dissed, decided to just leave it alone. But a week later, Michelle would slide into his DMs, and before too long, the two were dating. And a year later, they would highlight their love in a reality TV show called Chad Loves Michelle, where they showcased their very raw and unfiltered emotional roller coaster of a relationship, despite being very spiritually inclined. It was difficult because up to this point with their careers, the two had never spent more than a week in each other's presence physically. Everything had been over FaceTime, so it was a wild ride. And while the fans were here for it, many other viewers had reservations. For starters, though we all thought Chad was a high yellow fella, turns out he was just white, but with an urban appeal. I think he was white. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were saying, okay, here's this black woman with this white man. Here mm -hmm. is Candace Owens and her white, mm -hmm. white man. You know, mm. that's, that's how they were looking at That's it. what they were saying, Larry? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was they saying, Larry? <laughs> what was y'all saying, yeah. LRLers? Uh, and called a bed wench. Um, someone said that I am ruining the legacy of my African bloodline. Um, he's been called all kinds of, there's been so many untruths out there. With their many differences, they often clash over fundamental thoughts and behaviors. You would not understand why I communicate the way I do. Maybe because you didn't grow up around a lot of black people. And so that was very, very offensive to Chad. To me, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, green, yellow, it doesn't matter. If you know that the other person was like, I didn't like the way you said that, then seek to find some understanding as to why that person didn't like what you said, you know? And let's keep that the issue, not pull in all these other things, because then it feels like you're just trying to cut. Still, they were determined to prevail, and Chad would sneak away to Michelle's hometown meet all of her extended family members and get the blessing from her father before proposing to her. And Michelle tearfully, yet happily, accepted. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, yo, fellas, we gotta take note. This is how you do it. Beyonce, Kelly, put a ring on it! She put a ring on She would join B and Kelly one final time at Beyonce's 2018 Coachella, and they performed an array of hits and threw it back with the remix to Say My Name, which was my favorite part. But with all of the happy emotions that Michelle was feeling and being engaged, her depression and anxiety had been waiting for her at the door. They wouldn't let her be great, and she ended up having a psychotic breakdown and would check into the mental health facility. I was not ready for that to be made public yet. I was eventually going to tell it. Um, I was scared in that facility where I'm supposed to be trying to get help, but I'm looking over my shoulders to say, who told it? I left early, earlier than I would have liked because I didn't know. She was like, well, you, you're gonna have to close your curtains because sometimes paparazzi will have long lenses. The headlines were terrible and people blame Chad specifically for her sudden break. They think they know me. They think they know what's best for me because Chad has been the perfect person to be by my side. Throughout their rocky relationship, Everyone was rooting for them as their perseverance was inspiring to so many Christian couples and would make for an amazing testimony when they came out on the other side of the storm. Sadly, Michelle would call off the engagement twice and after the show ended, 
sought spiritual counsel after realizing her triggers and understanding that she simply wasn't ready for marriage and to do so in the public eye only added to the strain on her mental health. But she would find healing in an unlikely place, a singing competition called The Mass Singer where she appeared as the butterfly. Being heard and not seen was very therapeutic for her. I haven't worked all year since December of last year, so this was a way to come back strong. And I'm so glad to share with y'all. And being so brave and bold to come on our show, and that's going to inspire so many people out there who have maybe had some of the same struggles that you have. And I pray that this show is a real new beginning for you. Thank you so much. Thank y'all. The internet had already been trying to drag Michelle down for past actions, but a more known Michelle Williams would win an Emmy and give a very heartfelt speech in which she spoke out against the gender pay cap in Hollywood. Her speech sent tyrants on social media into a frenzy. However, Miss Lily White Beauty, Michelle Williams, had no social media, so she largely got away unscathed, and these trolls would redirect their anger to the only other famous Michelle Williams online, Miss Tanitra herself who was clearly a caramel complected cutie, but that didn't matter. They began ripping her to shreds due to no fault of her own, and she would hop on social media to give them a piece of her mind. This hand is your face. Reading is fundamental. Observation is, is so important. Observe that profile pic, all right? I'm gonna slap you back into having a good day because you almost tried to take me out of my peace. You tag me again. I pray that you get a spiritual slap. I pray that you get slapped in the spirit. I pray. Mm. Now, leave me alone. Michelle was always dealt negativity from hateful people, but the greatest pain was yet to come as her father would pass away on December 20th, 2020, after many years of health complications following a massive stroke he had suffered in the mid-2000s. She took to Instagram and wrote, I just don't know what to say or where to start. You fought harder than those of us that are in good health. For 15 years, you fought. You truly outlived moments where we thought you wouldn't make it. Though the holidays will never be the same, she did take comfort in knowing that he is not in pain any longer. And on May 25th, 2021, she would release her memoir titled Checking In, giving an insightful look into her life and how she has managed her mental health. She would also start the Checking In podcast, in which her and several guests and industry friends revealed their intimate experiences with depression, anxiety, and mental health. Oprah had listed the podcast in her top 10 anticipated podcast of the year, which was an honor before the podcast even began. I'm thinking about my journey, but I'm also thinking the safety of this interview and how many people don't have that because a lot of people are exploited or taken advantage of and they don't have a safe place to talk about their process and their journey. I feel even more cemented in my purpose and I'm on a mission to help as many people as I can. She would appear alongside Tina Knowles in the Lifetime film called Wrath and would discuss how much she's grown as she continues to grieve the passing of her father. Grief will come when you least expect it. I was drinking a smoothie um, in my kitchen and just the I just started weeping. Mm -hmm. One time I said, now, Dad, you can't die until I walk down the aisle. And he was like, I tried to wait, but you, you don't act right. <laughs> so he went on ahead and peaced out. He was like, I gave you it. I shut. You missed it, baby. I got to go. Now, do you I look, tried. Do you look at that as a sign? He like, man, it ain't happening for you. I'm it out. It ain't happening. It ain't happening. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm like, well, maybe I'm going to just be Oprah. And, and I'm okay with that. Well, not really. But I walk in my hotel room last night. And I'm like, man, this big old suite. And I can't swing from Nair chandelier. <laughs> <laughs> you could tell that she still longed for true love. And I can wholeheartedly relate to that feeling, baby girl. Trust me. But that's okay. We gonna get somebody. In early 2013, she posted up with her new pet. And a potential love interest made a few appearances in her clip. Could this be the start of something new? Michelle maintains that she plans to keep the public out of her romance affairs for now. <laughs> 
Though life had knocked her down more times than the average person could have handled, especially in the public eye, Michelle has remained victorious and triumphant throughout her journey, and her reoccurring theme is to just keep getting back up. The accolades continued to pour in as she would be inducted into Rockford's Fine Arts Hall of Fame. She is the true embodiment of how, after all of the darkness and sadness, soon comes happiness. And if you surround yourself with positive things, you'll gain prosperity. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like. Y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. And I'll catch y'all on the next one. You can win!